Welcome back to the show. We are now joined by Jens from Stadavarius from Finland. How are you? Uh, I'm great. Everything's good. Ah, fantastic. Well, I know the band goes all the way back to 84, but uh, talk, talk about um, your your history with the band and, and how it was, you know, how it was formed and how the uh, the current unit has all come together. Well, uh, my history goes back until when the hell was it? 1995 or, or thereabouts when I joined. Sure. Uh, by that By that point... They had already, at one point, rotated away all the original members, you know. So, and then what happened after that is like, actually, the, all, all the original members have been replaced like twice, two times over. So there's been quite a lot of, uh, you know, turnover in the in the roster of the band, you know, the, the personnel. But um, yeah, it's uh, it's been now uh, 20 years for me. Oh wow. So I know Timo joined about '94. So you were right after that. Yeah, exactly. He, he was like for, for one more album than me. Okay, so great. The two, two other guys who have been with it for the longest at the moment. <laughs> well, I know the the band is considered one of the most influential in the power metal genre. Talk talk about the the sound of the band and you know what drew you to uh, want to be a part of this. Well. That's a long story. It's um, like I said, I joined in '95, and I had heard a demo. Actually, it's an even stranger story. I'd heard a demo before they contacted me because uh, they had sent this demo out to a bunch of people, and somebody I knew had a demo. Outside, and they said like, "Hey, it's a Finnish band. Should we manage them or something like that?" And I thought, "Oh, this is kind of interesting. I didn't know that they had bands like that in Finland." And then, um, because I was living in the U.S. at the time. And um, what happened was that I got contacted by a fax, because this is how we did things back then, uh, by this Finnish guy who I had never really heard of, saying like, hey, do you want to come and join my band? <laughs> and I figured perhaps he could send me a CD then of the current album that they were going to put out, which was actually called, ended up being called Episode. But uh, he sent some demos eventually, and uh, they sounded really cool to me. It's like really, really good songwriting, I thought. So I figured I'd just go over uh, to Finland and record this one album, but I, I honestly, I thought, well, it's, it's cool sounding, but, you know, maybe nothing will come from this. So, but it did in the end. Uh, of course, it sort of took off. I think the whole scene, the whole metal scene took off at that point. Sure. Well, I know you go back to uh, playing with Ingve Malmsteen, uh, tell, tell us a little bit about transitioning, you know, from playing with him and, you know, what you learned most, you know, of playing with him and Rising Force. Well, I think what we learned, everybody who was in that band, it was actually, you know, you might think that all these stories are true and we were just like partying and it was like about beating up journalists or whatever Ingrid was doing. You know, it was like not so serious band, but we actually we actually worked a lot. That's what I remember most in a way. I mean, there was like some years where we had like maybe 150 shows, you know. And somehow in between all of the stuff, we managed to make a bunch of albums. So I think, uh, I guess we parted hard, but we also worked hard. But for me, it was like very, very fun. It was a lot of fun uh, because we were basically, uh, most of the time in the band, there was like three or four Swedish guys like mm -hmm. I'm Swedish too. So we would have a little bit this core of weird Northern European freakiness in the middle of the US. Like so it was it was kinda interesting. Uh, but I, I thought it was actually a lot of fun and definitely a learning experience that prepared me for for, you know, the music industry and, you know, basically being in a band on this level and stuff. So uh, Sure. I, I know growing up playing music, you know, you we all have kind of a fantasy of, of of what it's like, and a lot of those aren't really ready for the rigors, you know, of the touring and having to get up every day and catch flights and wait for shows and constant sound checking. And you know, what what was the biggest eye opener for you when you realized that, wow, this isn't just a big party. This is this is a lot of sacrifice and dedication. I think 
the biggest surprise was probably that still, when you had, and it was not only English band, it was like some other bands, how little, how poorly organized things were, you know, and they still somehow worked, because in the 80s there was so much money, and, you know, the turnover was great, you know, but uh, basically at, like, higher levels of management and also the record labels, there, there were, like, people, <laughs> I don't want to say anything mean, but let's put it this, this way, compared to today's business ethic, they were not perhaps business, business-like. business It was like a lot of partying and a lot of like craziness and, and a lot of uh, failure and a lot of, you know, like, I would say the 80s, there was so much money in, in circulation that it didn't matter if you were incompetent, really. Like, m- many things were just like, oh, you know, like, and then, you know, somebody would come in with a bag of money from the T-shirt and then, like, no accounting and, like, oh, well, how do we account for this? I don't know, just you take a pile and, you know, somebody's taking a pile money like and uh, of course the, the album releases were very often you know the labels would do this payola back in those days right they would essentially they would bribe radio stations to play your stuff on the radio and you know some guy at the label might be his job to, to, to fly around the whole country with giant bags of cocaine and you know and give to the radio station guys so that they would play their <laughs> the album you know that's like those were the business people you know, and then from the from the band and and so on, it, it somehow became worse. You know, we were never so much into drugs and stuff. We were more of a drinking band. But it's right. still, I'm very surprised how such a giant clusterfuck on every level. It's, it's still, we still managed to work that much, and we still managed to make all the albums, and they they managed to put them out. You know, and and you know they they got mixed, mastered, and you know they, the pressing plant was operating, and they were they were actually putting T-shirts, and you know some other machine worked even though that at every level there was like, a, you know, basically kids running the whole machine. Yeah. A kid, I think kids, that would be like an insult to kids. Yeah, it's kind of like the lunatics are running the asylum. You, yeah, you exactly. know? Like monkey monkey children or something like that. Like, yeah, it's one, you know, one, one, one big crazy children. world, and, and then somehow these companies all got acquired by bigger corporate companies, and, you know, a lot of those guys were let loose, and it's become... You know, big business now. I mean, it's, you know, all accountable and, you know, much, much different. Yeah. Now, obviously, growing up, exactly. you know, we used to love buying records and, you know, um, just, you know, music meant so much to us. And, you know, there's a danger in this younger generation that they they think music should be free and they don't value music, you know, as, as much, you know. Obviously, you've been playing for many, many years and you uh, you appreciate the, the legacy of, you know, decades and generations of of artists and musicians and producers and mixers and you know all the all the great craftsmen you know that make up this industry. What message do you have to the younger generation that music has a value and and you should appreciate it and you know uh, pay, pay a reasonable price for it. You know, nobody's trying to gouge anybody, but you know the whole infrastructure is dependent on you know the consumer paying something for music. Yeah. That's, it's true. Uh, it's very difficult to argue with now that the price has been brought down so low, and somehow I can't really get angry at the consumer, you know, because now, of course, you have like Spotify and stuff like that. But I think uh, the advice I would have, or like the, what I would say about it, is like, of course, now that you have Spotify and it's like free, you know, I, I know on the mobile platform, can't like play uh, playlists in order and stuff like that. But I think what you might, what what a young consumer might find, is that, you know, now it might be free, but then what happens when when the industry they might actually put the thumb thumb screws a little bit tighter year by year, and then you know like, you know maybe in one or two years, uh, you have to pay for Spotify to get certain releases. It's going to be more and more common, you know this type of thing. So what used to be free will not be free anymore, maybe. But I think in general, I mean, I can't blame the consumer for wanting music. I was the same way. I, I mean, when I was a kid, we used to copy cassette tapes, which was at least maybe not in Sweden, was not uh, illegal even by the letter or the spirit of the law. But in, in other country, it was like, you know, you're not supposed to take an LP and copy to, to cassette, and we sort of did it anyway because we were broke. So, of course, I can understand the... What what drives you to to do that? You know, like and of course it's a love for music because you want yeah. to hear some stuff. But uh, of course it's making life hell for everybody. 
That's what yeah, there's a lot, a lot of people's <laughs> careers, you know, involved here. It's, uh, yeah. it's a whole ecosystem, you know, from the engineer to the studio yeah. to the lighting director and the roadies and the graphic designers and the video editors and, you know, it's just uh, exactly. so, so important to see see the creative world continue to thrive rather than technology put everyone out of business. I think I, I think and I hope it will continue to thrive. I think there's going to be a lot of turbulence the next couple of years. But uh, of course, if, if what what the consumers perhaps could keep in mind too, it's like also in the 80s and the in the 1880s and the 1890s, every decade since recorded music started become invented, the person who always gets the shit end of the stick is usually the performer and the composer, and it's not different anymore now. You know, it's the same thing now. Uh, and of course, if you think about it a little bit longer, how how will any more interesting music get made if nobody gets paid for it? Like, it's right. uh, it's it's a danger in a way. Of course, people are still doing it because there's still some some money to be squeezed out. Uh, on the margin, you know, somehow. But you wonder in 10 years, I mean, will there be a band like Symphony X? Will there be like, because it's just like going to be so, I mean, it's very time, con time consuming and energy consuming and money consuming to make albums. Yeah. Uh, and will there be, will there be the same kind of development that we had, you know, in the golden, let's say the golden era of copyright, let's say the last hundred years, like, but uh, then again, Maybe Spotify, those guys, you know, they will be music consumers' worst nightmare, and it's going to be like, hey, you have to pay even more now if you want to hear all the music that you used to get for free. You know, now you don't get it anymore, and uh, all of these old options are gone. You know, like you don't have CDs you can fall back on. You you might be completely in the clutches of Spotify or Apple Music or somebody like that. <laughs> sure, sure. I don't know. Well, we, we, we hope for the best because music has been around for obviously many, many centuries. And, you know, it's um, it takes a lot of unique talents, you know, to make a, a great record, put on a great tour and a show. And, uh, you know, we, yeah, we, of course. we really, you know, have our hats off to the people that have dedicated their lives to do what they do. So I think it's very, very important. That's uh, that's a, that's a, value for that's music. Not for, for millennia, of course. You know, like as long as it's been music, people take the hats off. But what was this new invention, invention like that, say, 200 years ago, when they started discussing this copyright, of course it becomes, if you think about the way music has developed since since then, uh, it's become more broad. I would say it's been more popular music, because, of course, that's where the biggest incentive comes. And if you if you sell a million records, of course, you know, you, you have to make something that a million people actually like. But... Mm -hmm. uh, you can have this like mass movement in music, and you can have uh, I don't know, it's hard to explain, but there's also been on the in the niche music that's happened a lot of very, very interesting things the last two hundred years that probably would not have happened otherwise. Sure, and 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 tell us about Eternal. You know, I know this is a very important album and new chapter for Stradivarius. Tell, tell us about the making of the album and what you're most proud of. Well. They're all important. You have to approach each album as if it was like your last album, in a way. Um, but I would say, for me, to me, the approach of making an album now with the band is like a writing approach. We just have to try to get the best songs that we can, you know, uh, and somehow skate until we have the best songs and, and, and you know, then comes the process of putting them into the computer because you don't use tape anymore, but, <laughs> you know, putting them anyway, recording them, you know, somehow. Um, and of course, that's a lot of hard work, but I think the most important part is the songwriting process. And uh, it's no different now than from any of the three previous albums that we have made with this band because we have the approach that basically anybody who's in the band is allowed to write if they feel like it, and then we all consider what should be on the album or, or not. Uh, so I think normally with this lineup, it's been it's been um, quite easy to make the albums because there's always been so many so much material. Uh, but this time it actually took a little bit longer than on the previous three albums because I guess everybody had uh, I wouldn't call it the break, but 
everybody was just lazy about songwriting we discovered about a year ago like well haven't you written anything no not so many you know like oh fuck <laughs> so we just decided to wait another year and see what came you know if we had we had some more interesting ideas and we did so <laughs> so I think the trick is that you have much more material than you are going to record so that you can cut about half away half of it away and then you know, record the best half of what you have more or less sure and but we've had the same approach for the last four albums yeah it's not really a different um, approach wise but of course the songs are different and we know each other better and production wise we, we are doing better than we did you know two albums ago because we know a little bit about the pitfalls within the organization and we know each other's better as players and you know as, and as writers and you know it's a little bit easier but it's still difficult but. sure and in closing, what what other advice do you have to, you know, young creative people that, that that love music? They're trying to find, you know, a career path in in music, and maybe it's as a musician or a producer or some somewhere in the food chain. But you know, they're 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 not sure again if they can make a living at this. Um, what what advice do you give give to them as far as someone who wants to pursue this this career? I would say. Even though when I started, it was of course uh, possible to make a living, very possible. But I still had like sort of a backup plan that I was at least studying in parallel with practicing playing and stuff. I was studying that I could, so I could have like a normal job, like a, a day job or whatever. Uh, I didn't like quit school. You know, I know some people who who did quit school, and of course most of them I know because they are, they are musicians, so everything went okay. But I think might be sensible to have some sort of backup plan and then have to do it as a hobby for it and to see how the industry develops and of course also develop your skills, whatever it is, like as a producer or, or player or whatever. Uh, but, you know, apart from that, you just have to develop your uh, skill set, which is, of course, difficult, but you have to listen to what, what do you like. You have to do stuff you like, more or less. That's the best advice I would say I could give, like... Get a backup plan and get involved in stuff that you like. Sure. Best you can. Well, Jens, we appreciate it. Best of luck on the new album and tour, and can't wait to keep spreading the word on Stradivarius. We appreciate your time. All right. Thanks a lot. Thank you.